These Fast Break Ideas presentations highlight multiple partners who are exploring innovative ways to ensure all youth have access to sport and pump big ideas into the bloodstream in a compelling format. We're going to be using Slido for this session. Uh, so go to slido.com, hashtag project play. We're on the eighth floor, and we'll be getting to those questions at the end. I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Trish Sylvia, the co-founder and CEO of the National Center for Safety Initiatives, which develops a system for protecting vulnerable populations and offers background screening program endorsed by the National Council for Youth Sports. Trish. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for being here at this session, and thank you to the Aspen Institute for putting together this amazing event. Are you having a great day so far? I know I am. <laughs> so for the next six minutes, 40 seconds, I want to talk about <laughs> prevention strategies that make a difference. Protecting our kids is something that's vitally important, and it's a responsibility we all share. NCSI was formed in partnership with the National Council of Youth Sports. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but we're a mission-based organization. Our overarching goal is the eradication of harm in organizations and communities. And um, essentially, over time, since we started, we've worked with thousands of organizations and we've helped to keep millions of athletes safe. Our work most closely aligns with play number seven and play number eight. Just a little bit about me. <laughs> um, 15 years ago, or thereabouts, I had the honor of founding NCSI. And over these years, I've learned that one of the ways to help keep our kids safe is to create up cultures of zero opportunity, zero tolerance. Wait, you might say, isn't youth sports all about opportunity? Well, not when we're talking about sexual abuse in sport, not when the safety of an athlete or a child is at stake. Then zero opportunity, zero tolerance is exactly what we need. We've all seen the headlines, organizations brought to their knees by devastating actions of coaches and others in positions of trust. Athletes whose lives have been changed as a result of this. The story goes beyond the headlines to deeply rooted societal issues to ask us to change what we're thinking and how we're behaving in this area. In our country, one in 10 children will be the victim of child sexual abuse. And get this, only 10% of the offenders are strangers. We have to do more to keep our kids safe. Do you know before 2005, the youth sports industry largely didn't have standards of care relating to safety? We set out to change this. <coughs> we saw a big gap. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm off by a slide. This is messing me up a little bit. <laughs> so I told you, we were founded in partnership with the National Council of Youth Sports. Wayne Moss presented earlier today, and before him, Sally Johnson was relentless in her pursuit for safety. Um, before 2005, the youth sports industry largely didn't have standards of care relating to athlete protection. We saw this as a big gap. And so there were three areas that we focused on. A reliable and systematic approach to the screening of volunteers, background screening programs that match their level of responsibility, and other prevention strategies. In 2005, the NCYS published the recommended guidelines um, that serve as an, out as an approach, an outline to an approach to safety that addresses these three areas. Today, the guidelines are the foundation of screening programs for thousands of organizations. I just mentioned background screening that matches the level of responsibility. This didn't exist, so we created it. Recognizing that quality and reliability were desperately lacking, we changed the game. Are all background checks created equal? You're right, no, <laughs> they're not. In fact, we found um, that more than 40% of records were missed using a database-only approach. These are still actually being used today in some, in some instances. So every search we conduct has a baseline standard that we won't compromise. Our goal in all of this was to improve safety. We have a disparity. The organizations with the greatest amount of responsibility often have the lowest amount of resources, human and financial. This created a big challenge, and for us, we saw it as a big opportunity to help. 
Background screening should never be thought of as a be-all, end-all when it comes to safety. This might sound a little counterintuitive to what I'm talking about, but it's not. Organizations need to think about other methods, including training, policies, and response incident reporting systems. So together, these kind of begin to create that zero opportunity, zero tolerance climate. So coming back to center, why is all of this so important? A child's life is changed forever when they're hurt in this way. Darkness to Light reports that victims of child sexual abuse are at greater risk for emotional issues, including PTSD, depression, and even suicide. Sports shouldn't hurt our kids, ever. We need to do better. Like most things, when we help others, we help ourselves. These programs done right will help to protect your assets, your people, and your brand. Youth sports organizations are often cash businesses. There are many examples of theft and embezzlement that may have been uncovered in background screening that instead went undetected. Insurance costs and costs related to settlements can put an organization in jeopardy. We focus on protecting the child as our first and greatest responsibility. It is. The strategies that we're talking about, though, can also help to protect the people who are running the organizations who also deserve to have some their personal interests protected. The success of youth organizations largely depends on membership. Membership depends on reputation and trust. One negative story can greatly impact the perception of an organization. Trust is earned through our actions, and being responsible about safety helps to protect your good name. To accomplish true safety in youth sports, it takes all of us. Today, NCSI is part of the sports engine, NBC Sports, family of businesses. We're honored to be on this journey with you. Together, we'll embrace our collective responsibilities to ensure the future greatness of youth sports. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trish. Our second presenter is Dr. David Ridpath, an associate professor of sports business at Ohio University and also the author of Solutions to a Crisis in Education and Public Health. David. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me up here. I've got to get used to this too. Trish makes us all look bad. I told you not to do that, but you did a great job. My name is Dr. Dave Ridpath. I'm an associate professor at Ohio University, and I'm here to talk to you today about a research project I did that morphed eventually into a book entitled A New Game Plan, How Adopting Alternative Sport Development Models <laughs> in America Can pre Help Prevent a Crisis in Education and Public Health. I know you see a face up there only a mother can love, right? <laughs> Why I did this? Have some friends in the audience. I worked in college athletics for a number of years, saw it from the ground up, warts and all, and I became convinced that there's better ways to do sports in America beyond having the bulk of our elite development grounded in education. So what I want to talk today is about what can we do to make sports in America better, more accessible, to support project play initiatives, and move away from educationally based sport development in the elite space. Not that it can't still be used, but what are some other things we can do? Clearly, most of you know, we are the only country in the world that has the bulk of our elite sport development grounded in education and having an educationally based sports system that in many ways is based upon our entertainment, elite development, and commercialism. In many ways, that needs to change. Why? In the picture you see up there. Is it accessible? Is it for mass participation? Does it support what we've talked about here in Project Play? Or has it become about us watching and becoming a nation of spectators, becoming unhealthy? It has much greater implications than if our favorite school won or not. So what I'm talking about today is change, thinking of a new way to do things. The baseline I want us all to reach, and I think we can all reach this, is accepting in America that what we do today isn't working and we can evolve to a new system or systems. And that's what I've talked about in my research, which I'll get to a little bit here. What you can see on the screen is I developed in my book four conceptual models that we can move to in America, whether it's parts of each model or each model alone, 
to actually change how we do sports in America and make it better, to support things like we're here today to support the Project Play initiatives. Because we need to have greater access, train coaches, more free play, all those things, without losing the access to elite development. But we know what's happening in educationally based sports is we're losing opportunities because we're more focused on winning, even at the very lowest levels of our sport. How is this going to start? Well, this building, which is right over here, which we're so happy to see, right, is it all starts with the national sports policy. If you were downstairs and you heard earlier talking about what they've done in Norway, what they've done in Saudi Arabia, we don't have a vision in America, in my view. We have people in silos. We have a very decentralized, de disjointed sport development system. So moving to the models, and I'm talking about these very brief, but first one is actually making educationally based sports about what they're supposed to be, right? About education first. I don't want you to think that this would make sports inaccessible for those from underrepresented populations. It's actually giving them a chance to get what they want out of this system, which is an education. Model two talks about, how about we just wave the white flag? Let's wave the white flag on football, men's basketball, and other commercialized sports, and let them do what they want to do. Pay athletes, do whatever, whatever they want to, and then return the other sports in the school system back to a more educational model. I will tell you, if we would adopt model one or model two, other systems would manifest themselves, and it's an opportunity. Other systems outside of the educational system. Model three is more of the Euro club approach, actually having outside sport clubs like you see in virtually every other country in the world but having those opportunities for sports outside of education as a complement to it. And then model four, however unlikely this may seem, we should look at completely lifting and separating actual sport development, not sports sampling, competition, and things like that, but elite sport development out of the educational system completely. These are just to start the conversation. Again, as I said, not the end all be all. How do we pay for it? We heard some great solutions downstairs, right? The government's got to have skin in the game. We have to have a national sports policy. I can't be in this town and mention higher taxes, but guess what? If we do that, we could actually lower costs, overall health care costs, and things like that. It's an investment for the future. It's an investment for what you see on the screen. Our kids, our youth, right? We can get money from, obviously, gambling, lottery proceeds, grants. Our professional sports leagues that for long have had a free system of development need to contribute more. They have billions of dollars to do that. So the money is there to change the system if we want to do that. We have to evolve. It's supposed to be about education, right? It's supposed to be about education. Education is the true way to social mobility. It isn't that kid that the only way he could get to college is because he or she could get a basketball scholarship. That's backwards thinking. Everybody can get to college, right? And we have to use education as a social mobility, but we also have to have opportunities for elite development. What I'm talking about is a new way, getting to that baseline and accepting all of us in this room and around the country saying, we know what we're doing now isn't working. What can we do to improve on it? Are we ready to take a new way? Are we ready to change the way we do sports development in America? What door do we want to open? I think the door that we can't open and the door we need to close is our current model. And we need to look at other models. We'll evolve, we'll adjust. We're suckers in America. We just love to watch the games, right? We'll watch games regardless of what they are. And we'll watch them, we'll watch our schools play regardless of who's playing. You can read more about this. In my book, Shameless Promotion, you'll see the forward is written by our own Tom Ferry. So if you read anything, you'll want to read that, right? Uh, alternative Models of Sports Development in America. It's out, it's hot off the presses, and for the first 10 people that fall in line over here later, I, I will sign a copy for you for free of charge. Others, I have little cards, and I have a little stockpile in my office. If you email me until I run out of my stockpile, I will mail you a copy of my book. Others, please buy it, but my charge to you is, is that you have to read it and give me feedback, good or bad, and you also have to share it with someone because I want this message to spread and resonate amongst our communities. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dave. Our third presenter is Kiana Patterson, the Senior Director of Public-Private Partnerships at Hot Skip Drive. She's a former teacher and middle school administrator, here to tell you about this organization developed by safety-obsessed moms. Kiana. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't know how I follow after you, but I'm going to figure it out how to do it. Uh, I am Kiana Patterson, and uh, as he said, I am the public-private pri partnership director at Hop, Skip, Drive. Essentially, we don't like to say it, but it literally is Uber for kids um, by safety-obsessed moms. Um, I have been advocating for equity and access for a long time, both in education and in technology. And now I spend my days and nights advocating for mobility for vulnerable populations, especially for children. Um, it's no um, thing, you can see it right here, that you, uh, sports participation is down. Um, and that we can see that um, it's been declining over several years. I benefited from community-based sports. I was a track, uh, I ran track and I played basketball. And primarily the way that I got to those things were because I traveled by walking to those parks. Um, we know now that the data shows that over 40% of youth do not participate in sports because they have no way to get there. Transportation, more than funding, more than anything else, it literally is transportation. So we all know, Kevin Costner said in the movie Field of Dreams, if you build it, what? They will come. How about if we build it, they have no way to get there, right? And so what we do is we essentially solve that problem. I am uh, leading the effort around vulnerable populations, but as you see in front of you, this was founded, and this is the inspiration, eight children, five different schools, and 20 different activities by three moms. They wanted to solve the problem that they faced themselves. How do we, even um, living on the west side of Los Angeles, who have lots of money, have issues with getting our children around. So imagine the other half of the country. So this number, 400,000 in particular. There are over 400,000 kids in the US right now who are involved in the child care welfare system, foster youth. 50%, only about 50% of them actually graduate from high school and less than 3% go on to graduate college. In some states like Colorado, only 23% of foster kids graduate from high school. It really is troubling as you think about it, some of the things that occur for foster youth. And um, my colleague talked about trauma and things that kids like this face. In Los Angeles, which is the largest child welfare system in the nation, 35,000 kids are in care. One of the things that have happened is they essentially, child welfare uh, experts said, guess what? We have to figure out a way to get kids back and forth to school. One of the reasons why kids are not graduating is because they move from placement to placement. And the one challenge that they had was, how do we essentially get kids to school when they're moving and moving? We don't have vans and buses just sitting around waiting for these kids. So last year, we piloted a partnership with LA County to get kids back and forth to school. One of the things that happened was kids were getting to school, and it was great. But the other thing that was happening is that kids were missing out on the opportunity to get to after school sports and activities and all those kinds of things. And I'm a little bit behind, but um, GM and CASA, and CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates, came together and they said, there's no reason why we shouldn't get kids to activities outside of school. So GM, and I'm announcing this, this is the first time we've publicly announced it, has decided to give a grant to CASA to support transportation to use sports and other kinds of things. So we have to ask ourselves, what if we built a way to get kids to school and to activities and to sports, right? Right now, what we see is child welfare systems and LEAs and school districts have a way to get them to school and there's funding, but there's no extra funding to get them to other things outside of school. Right now, Hop, Skip, Drive is in um, five regions. We are all throughout California and all throughout Colorado, supporting primarily schools and districts and child welfare agencies to get them back and forth to school. We drive children from the ages of six to 18 and even seniors and other vulnerable populations like disabled. 
we, you can see on the map that we are looking to expand. How many of you need the, a transportation solution, right? Lots of people, and so people from Seattle and St. Louis and DC and Virginia have said, we need you to come here, and we want to expand, and we want to service more groups. Our care drivers, and that's what we call them um, internally, are um, mostly moms. 95% of them are women. We don't discriminate against men, but this attracts a certain kind of person. Um, they are background checked, fingerprinted. We're the first rideshare company in the nation to fingerprint all of our drivers. Uh, they go through trauma-informed care and other training to support this work that we do. Um, we essentially built this by safety-obsessed moms, so we understand what it takes to put your child in a car with a stranger, and we've done that more than 400,000 times uh, to date. We started in 2014. So we are on the road to remove mobility as a barrier to get kids around wherever they need to go, whether that is to therapy, to school, or to soccer practice. We're a passionate, visionary-driven team, and I myself am a former foster youth child. So this hits home for me because I did have placement changes. And I, at the end, had to catch three buses to get to school if I wanted to remain in that school. I was a cheerleader, a basketball player, and an honor student. So this is, for me, very, very personal. And I appreciate you guys listening. Thank you. Thank you, Gianna. And our fourth and final presenter is Doug Riffenberg from Victory Sports Global Outreach, who has been a tremendous ally for my work with Project Play Western New York. Doug. Thank you, Marty. Appreciate that. Yeah, my name is Doug Riffenberg. I'm the executive director of Victory Sports Global Outreach based in Buffalo, New York. Our mission is to help under-resourced schools, sports programs, athletes obtain the equipment that they need in order for them to be able to play, compete, and be active. Uh, the first issue that I kind of came across about four years ago that gave me the idea of starting Victory Sports was I had a garage that kind of looked like this. Um, full disclosure, that's not my garage, because my garage would never be that organized. If yours looks like that, I don't think I like you anymore. But, um, but we all have garages and sheds and basements that look like this, where our kids are growing, they're growing so fast that we have equipment laying around that can't be used anymore. At the same time, we know that there's inner city kids that can't afford any of that equipment we have laying around our garage. The other part of it's happening in society right now, the other part of the kids, they're all on their tablets and computers and phones, and they're not being active. So about a year and a half ago, I came up with the idea of starting to collect sports equipment throughout our community. So we do partnerships with corporations, with schools, with sports teams, and just individuals within the, the community, and we collect sports equipment, anything from new equipment, gently used, to even beat up garbage that we then throw out. But we then, a year and a half, about a year ago, August 1st in 2017, we actually moved into a 2,000 square foot warehouse where we collect equipment, we sort it, we bring in volunteers from the area schools and community centers, and we clean the equipment, we sort it, we inventory it, we stock it, and we make it available to those programs within the city of Buffalo and surrounding areas. Um, if they need it, they apply for it, they can get it. Um, we, over the last year, we've partnered with probably over 50 different organizations, probably impacted over 5,000 youth in, in Western New York by just offering them something that we can get for free and just give away to somebody else. The Buffalo area has a very large refugee population. So this next slide, you'll see it's a family that have, of five kids that came from the Middle East. They, they actually witnessed their father and both uncles being murdered. They got here. And the only thing they missed, or the one thing they missed the most, was their bikes. So we got a call from one of the service agencies in Buffalo, and we outfitted this family with bikes and helmets. And you, would just, you wouldn't believe the smile on their faces and what we were able to do. On top of helping local um, sports organizations, we also partner with churches and missionary groups that are sending people overseas to third world countries. So we've sent equipment to probably eight different countries, including Haiti, the Dominican, Kenya, um, and, and other areas. So whether they need soccer equipment, sports equipment, any type of recreational equipment, we send along with them. Colin Kaepernick, I think we've all seen and heard his name a lot over the last couple of years. He really brought to the forefront the whole idea of social injustice, uh, police brutality, things like that, racial inequality. 
Well, uh, a man named Nelson Mandela, who used to be the president of South Africa, has one of the greatest quotes ever about youth sports. It says, sports has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language that they understand. Sports can create hope where once there is only despair. It is more powerful than governments in breaking down racial barriers. I took that concept and along with some of the viral videos that we've probably seen online over the last couple of years of a police officer playing basketball or tossing a football with youth. And that goes viral because it's such a unique one-off situation. Well, what if we could make that where it wasn't that unique? What if we could make that where it's an everyday occurrence for a police officer? So we came up with the idea of Bridge the Gap Sports. Right now, it's a partnership between the Buffalo Police Department with Victory Sports and also with sponsorship and funding help from the Buffalo Bills Foundation. And what we do is we outfit police officers with sports equipment. Uh, the timing was perfect for this because in Buffalo we got a new, uh, new commissioner, C Commissioner Lockwood, that believes strongly in community policing. So they put together what they call the Neighborhood Engagement Team. These officers, their only job is to go out into the community and build relationships with kids and families to help in the end bridge that gap between the relationships that they have between the police and the kids. Um, so every officer that's part of this team, there's 15 or 16 officers, that, that those positions just became permanent. So this is gonna become a permanent division within the Buffalo Police. Every officer get, got a duffel bag with soccer balls, footballs, and um, soccer balls, footballs, and um, basketballs. And they were able to just do uh, different community events. This, that first picture there was a kickball game that we did on a vacant corner on the east side of Buffalo where there's probably higher crime rates than anywhere else. All summer long, I partnered in every one of the police department's open houses, community days, block parties. I would bring a basketball uh, hoop, I'd bring a, a football toss, and just help the police engage with the kids and again, build relationships and friendships. We went and set up basketball hoops on street corners for those kids in the community to be able to play. Again, always with the police officers involved with that. So they were getting the credit, not Victory Sports. And uh, again, that was just a great story where the city actually came and took down a, a basketball hoop earlier that morning. So that mother came to an event, was very irate. So rather than that becoming something that would escalate to a bigger problem, I took the basketball hoop we had over to her house and set it up on their street. We also did soccer clinics three nights a week. So every Monday, Wednesday, Friday in different parks and vacant lots around the city of Buffalo, the police would engage with the kids in their community. We had probably over 100, 130 kids every single week playing soccer with police officers. A Couple of weeks ago, we partnered with the Buffalo Bills. We did a ride along. So we had three Buffalo Bills with three Buffalo police officers. They went to a high school football practice and a youth football practice. We supplied them with all the footballs they needed to play catch and sign autographs. Again, the Buffalo Bills have been a great partner in this. We're hoping that eventually this can maybe become more of a national uh, program that we can roll out to Detroit and other cities where there's NFL teams that we can help them partner with their community. Again, the Bills actually brought about a dozen kids that had never been to a, a Bills game before. This was a preseason game with about half a dozen officers. This is just a picture of a little boy from Kenya that's part of Westside International Soccer. This little guy never owned a pair of cleats before. And I gave him a pair of cleats and that kid grabbed onto me so tight and wouldn't let go. And that, just, that picture pretty much says it all. That's why we all are here. That's why we all do what we do. It's about building relationships and uh, changing the world. So thank you. Ask the rest of our panelists to join me on stage for a few minutes of Q&A. My friend Karthik in the back. Yeah, so our first question will come from Chris. What would you say to a criticism that involves school sports tied to education being the main source of accountability towards our student athletes? <laughs> What's that for me? Yeah, I'm assuming. I apologize. <laughs> Can you ask me? We were again? moving Marty, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, miscounted chairs. What would you say to a criticism that involved school sports tied to education being the main source of accountability toward our student athletes? Well, I would say that that's uh, flawed, flawed uh, because we're, we're not holding our athletes accountable. What we're holding our athletes to is an arbitrary eligibility standard so we can be entertained. Uh, we are not giving them access to education. We're not giving them access to the majors that they want. And we're not giving them, in many cases, I'm not saying all cases, real social mobility. Again, I'm not saying that we can't have educationally based sports, okay? I'm not saying that we can't have college athletics or high school athletics. 
we need to take the stress off the educational system and have other models to be able to develop athletes. Uh, right now, school-based sports, by and large, are about winning. At the intercollegiate athletic level, it's about winning big and revenue generation and brand protection. That is far away from the model that we originally developed. Um, can you talk to how things have changed with recent news like Nasser and Penn State? Are things changing fast enough? So um, that's a very good question. I think you know the second part of it, we can never change fast enough when we're talking about such important issues at stake. Um, you know, mobilizing every single heart <laughs> action that we have, along with our collective, you know, brain and horsepower towards this issue, is very very important. Um, I do see acceleration in the mobilization. I do see progress, um, but until we have a country and an environment where every child can be safe in sport and in any venue they're in, we still have work to do. And don't forget those situations were largely fueled by trying to protect a culture and a brand mm -hmm. of winning, commercialism, and money. Let's be honest. Uh, can the group speak to how we could start something like your programs in our communities? Who are the stakeholders we need to invest? Yeah. I'll talk a little bit about, um, about Bridge the Gap Sports. It started just with a conversation with the Buffalo Police Department. Um, you might, we all have a local police officer or police department that we could start a conversation with. Um, I then shared that with a contact I had at the Buffalo Bills and they right away were all about helping out and helping sponsor that. So it's really just starting the dialogue. I happen to have somebody that's part of the Buffalo Police Department on my board of directors. So he helped get in and start that conversation with the commissioner. But really it's about everything. It's about building relationships. It's about using your contacts and your network and, um, and just starting the conversation. Uh, I was gonna, go ahead. I, I would add for, for us, it, it, to piggyback on that, it really is about the relationships. So one of the things that we have that is supporting us uh, is um, ESSA, which is Every Student Succeed Act. They added a provision in two years ago that mandated that um, homeless, uh, homeless youth already had it, but foster youth in particular had to be able to get to their school of origin. So there is a mandate that forces that. So that's an easy conversation mm -hmm. that's for us to have with school districts, with county welfare agencies. I think the other big piece of this is um, having conversations and dialogue with local foundations to support the other things. What schools and child welfare agencies are concerned about is just getting kids to school. That's it, right? They're not necessarily um, worried about funding, getting kids to therapy appointments, or figuring out how to keep them in soccer, or how to get them to an away game. Um, those are things that they, they can't wrap themselves around just yet, and so we need to partner with foundations um, already on the ground who know the region that we're gonna go into and launch into, really support that ever and galvanize around these children. Yep. Go ahead. Sure, I think when we think about safety, one of the things that we, for, for too long, we relied on the child to be the voice and to tell us that something was wrong. Um, or we look to the top of, a, of an organization. And I think when we're thinking about safety, it's like looking at the entire um, spectrum of stakeholders. Like who, who's between that child and the top of the organization? Um, you know, there are parents in that mix. There are coaches in that mix. There are schools. There are volunteers. There's amazing organizations. Like Darkness to Light has tons of resources on this topic. And so I think like, you know, instead of looking here or looking here, it's kind of the everything in between that I think really will help us answer um, some of our issues relating to safety. And I think, you know, from my perspective is um, change is going to happen. Um, we, it's inevitable when you look at what's going on in the space that I talk about, intercollegiate athletics and scholastic sports, when you look at the lawsuits that are going on, things that my colleagues up here talked about, you know, access to sports equipment, safety, uh, kids who need that, that hand up, sports can help change that. So you know, you're, from my perspective, for things to change 
the way that I would like to see, and others, others view it the same way, is it would have to be top down or bottom up. Obviously, from top down, you're certainly looking at a national sports policy, you're looking at political solutions, but I do think we're going to find ourselves with sport in America where we're going to say, what do we do next? And my hope is that all of us in this room and downstairs will say there's ways to do it better. And uh, I would love to see maybe from a bottom up to maybe a community mm -hmm. that can show that we're doing this. Look, we have these systems outside of the school system. It benefits kids who can't get equipment. It ben it's, it's safe for the kids. It benefits those you know, that, that don't have the access or the transportation to get to certain things or the money, the money to pay for high school sports. I, that's a whole other thing we can get into. We're making sports less and less accessible. And I loved what was said downstairs is you know, high fives and handshakes leads to success at the elite level. We're forgetting about the high fives and handshakes and we can use the school system for that. We can also use other models for that. These are all incredible initiatives. Difficult question, what have been your strategies for securing that initial funding to take this from idea to reality? Well, um, we are privately funded. We are a venture-backed uh, VC, com a venture-backed company. Um, so that was the initial, we had to get traction. We have, you know, had brilliant founders who happened to be women who pitched this idea and um, really solved a real problem. Um, that really existed. We don't, and I like to tell people, I don't actually have to manufacture a problem. It exists. Um, and so that's the beauty. It's a, it's a bad thing that's a problem still today in 2018, but it's a problem nevertheless, and we were the ones who were willing to solve it. Yeah, our process has been one of organic growth. Um, I can tell you 15 years ago, you know, it really came with a, a heart-based mission, believing that things could be different. And it often felt like pushing a boulder, you know, up the side of a mountain. There wasn't momentum for it at that time. Um, I remember coming to, uh, you know, conferences and forums, and I kind of felt like I was like the one, hey, don't sit with her, she's going to talk about child sexual abuse or something at lunch, right? <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I think the conversation has changed over the last decade, and that's one of the biggest pieces of evidence that I have that, that we've made progress. And then today, certainly being part of the sports engine, NBC Sports, you know, my hope is that we only get bigger and stronger and more able to solve our problems. And um, so I guess, you know, it, <laughs> there's a lot of work that is in the early part. I think yeah. we'd all agree with that. Um, and then over time and with passion and with commitment, um, doors open and resources become available and more people you know, step in and say, we wanna be part of this. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm a, I'm a young not-for-profit. I'm just a little over one year old. So um, for me, the initial funding came from an individual that helped us get started and get us on our feet. After that, it just starts coming uh, down to impact and outcomes. Mm -hmm. And when you can start showing that what you're doing is making an impact and affecting lives mm -hmm. and affecting kids, other organizations see that. And that's where grant money becomes an, op you know, becomes an opportunity for you, whether it's in Buffalo, there's the Community Foundation of Greater Buffalo. We've been able to partner also with Ralph C. Wilson and others in the city that I think those relationships will continue to grow. Um, and the timing was great for us when we started was really when the whole state of play initiative kind of rolled out at the exact at the exact same time so um, So the timing was good for us, but it it is it's it's faith It's chasing and going after some of the, the small funds and uh, grant opportunities to kind of keep these things going But it's all comes down to impact and and uh, and outcomes. Uh, I think my colleagues all they all answered um, many ways that, that groups that I work with in, in trying to change how we do educationally based sports development are doing. But in, in our case, kind of playing on the same word, it's educating. We're battling a massive PR machine that says so many hundreds of thousands go pro in something other than sports and they don't talk about the thousands and thousands of stories where we are exploiting kids. You know, and it sounds great on paper. Wow, look at this, you know, elite athlete getting a college scholarship. It's not all it's cracked up to be. So for us, we're pulling back the curtain. We're telling the story. We're getting more and more stakeholders understanding it. And when you see what's going on 
in the legal system. Uh, we actually have sponsored a bill that's in Congress right now. Of course, it's languishing because we have the midterms coming up. But we're educating people. We're getting people on the political side. We're getting people on the entertainment side, former athletes, former coaches who are saying, you're right. There's better ways to do this. And um, if we can convince people over there, only a few of them so far, but we've convinced some people over there, we've convinced some people that work in the industry that there are better ways. I mean, we have to look at it. I mean, we are very good at elite competition in America. One day, if we continue to shrink those opportunities and the only one of the few systems we have that is semi-accessible, maybe we'll wake up and say, geez, why aren't we as good in this sport as we used to be? Wrestling, which is my sport, for instance, or something like that. Well, I can tell you exactly why. It's because the opportunities have been taken away because we're focusing too much on our entertainment product rather than developing the sound mind and body. So it's really just educating all of them. Our professional sports leagues, they don't have to pay a dime for this. Okay, it's time for them to start paying a dime. Mm -hmm. You know, it's time for the Buffalo Bills. You have a free system, Buffalo, and all the other NFL teams. It's time for you to kick a few billion back this way. And then we can develop alternative leagues. That's an option. <laughs> we are just about at time. We've gotten a lot of upvotes on two specific questions with regards to um, hot skip drive. So one is, does it have a free option for lower income families? And the second is, how much is a hot skip drive um, ride? So um, there is no free option. However, there are ways to um, get it funded, like I said, through uh, the school district and other mechanisms that um, when foster youth and others are booking rides and scheduling rides, they're not actually paying for those rides. The, the county welfare agency, someone else is paying for it. So for them, it is a free ride. Um, and then the price is depending on the region. So how we price it is there's a base fee plus per mile. So you are going to pay more than what you would pay for Uber or Lyft. But remember, Uber and Lyft drivers are not fingerprinted. They don't necessarily meet everyone in person. They're not heavily vetted. So you are paying a premium cost for something like this. But what would you, what's, what's the price for putting your child in a car that you know is safe by a driver? So that, that's the, the, the trade-off for it. But we're, we're essentially the way we price it too is our drivers are care drivers or caregivers on wheels. So it's a, the amount that you might pay for an hour of babysitting. So it's comparable to that given the regions that we're in. But as a nonprofit, could you get some type of external subsidies or even government subsidies to lower the cost? Yes. So what I said was that GM has come in and provided a grant to a nonprofit that now that nonprofit can utilize our services essentially for free. And I think that if this is successful, GM and others will expand that in those given regions based on what they want to support. So yeah. Fantastic idea. Yeah. Thanks again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all.